Thanks very much for having me. I'm very happy to talk about this. And if you have any questions or comments, come find me because this was essentially a speed run through a particular part of both the section, and this will be a speed run through the fall of the class talking. I've managed the vet collection. I've been in my role of probably three years now in July. And just for a bit of context, this was done while there was other projects with my colleague and um, the study will be covering later. So with that in mind, our wet connection is stored in a range of things, field tanks, and what we call spare presses, or what I believe is called tablets here, but I will be referring to the spare presses from now on. We have 220 of these now, and we have 196 at the time of the survey. And just a note on connection care. We write down how many need a top up or if there are any in poor condition, and if we use an initial and the time and date. And just to draw your attention to my age, ACG at the bottom, you can see that there's been a bit of time in between my role and the previous time spent in the spirit press, like 10 years sometimes. This isn't through a lack of care for the patients of capacity, the staffing or understaffing of the National Museum Department has been put on and elsewhere. It's just to touch on that. So with that, I'm having come into the role um, in the midst of the second lockdown and with other projects going around. When I had been spare time, I thought I might as well have enough perception that I was going to be looking at there. The spare press is called everything that's kind of small, rainy side that you can be seen here next to the, the returns and catalog. It's everything that effectively doesn't need to go into a large jar or small tank. The tool we have, which is available with the is a handheld refractometer with automatic temperature correction. So taking into account the temperature, it looks at the level of refraction that happens in the tool that you put on the end, and you read it off this little uh, gradient on the side, which goes up and maybe into two, and it stops off at 80. This works well for small volumes. I know people I use different density measures, but for say, for example, a hydrometer, you need to use it up for large volume with no concentration. So you might as well run and survey things. And with that in mind, um, I decided that I love a bit of methodological comparison to randomize my sampling for it and then do a strategic sampling of just measuring concentration of things at left. These are the results of that. Um, there was just under 800 specimens measured, about 790 concentration readings taken, and these are the results of that. There was 14 taxa, and then I'm not going to go into too much detail for numbers, but just at your bottom left, it kind of is reflective of the wet connection in the whole, so I was fairly happy with that representation. I was also fairly happy to see the majority of the collection was well above 50% concentration for alcohol which means that it's in good nick for low 50, you can start to get my golden action and option load. And um, our collection is also representative of the interest of previous curators. You can see our crustaceans are by far the most abundant. That was because of the previous curator, Mark Holmes, interest in crustaceans. Really, really interested in crustaceans. <laughs> And it's just uh, a note to anyone else. Um, there was no statistical difference with chi or t square or t test between the two methods. So if you have the choice, I would say check your methods. Don't have a difference after 30. Don't bother going to 200 for the sake of it. And um, just for time, using a random number generator as you're looking at each individual door and each sphere presses can be time consuming along with the individual readings you're writing down if you have kind of a free parameter. Also, just on another note, one percent of readings are out of range, so they're either that low or above that 80. 80 is quite high for concentration, but a handheld refractometer is a good measure. And um, we now have a handheld density meter, which is really good because it takes into account most other things, temperature and individual reading. But there can be things that can affect the concentration or the reading you get from the handheld refractometer. And one of those is suspended pigments and sugar. Say, for example, if there's glycerin in the and the complications that people need to tend to drop in to stop their specimens dehydrating. Also, the middle one there um, would indicate the yellowish color, indicates that the cooling solution of uh, picric acid and something you never want to let dehydrate has been used to fix the material. So, you start getting a better idea of the collection by just seeing the colors. And the far left green fish isn't um, something unusual. <coughs> It turns out from talking to my predecessor that there was a copper compound in the tanks that leached into the solution. So we have some lovely green fish and cnidarians. But again, you wouldn't know, I wouldn't have known if I hadn't gone individually for each of those drawers to take measurements. Also, this pink graph, if anyone wants to talk to me at the end, I'm still trying to figure that out. 
um, I figured that it does now, um, which is just to give you an idea of the range of colors he's also finding in the survey. And there was a lot of things about the museum that make experimental rehydrations. And just in summary, it's not a perfect technique, but it was a really good one for familiarizing myself with the collection, getting a snapshot of it. It was very representative. It was a speed run. Again, that knows is more for myself than anyone else. If you are randomizing method, check that there's a difference sooner rather than later. And of course, all the rehydrations have to happen after this experiment. Thanks very much for your time.